data security, firewalls, encryption, password, access levels, and security software. So we're going to take a look at a few different types of data security tools that can be used in order to protect and secure different networks that store confidential information and maintain privacy. So we're going to look at some of the tools, but there are more tools which I might cover in a future video as well. But firstly, we'll take a look at a firewall. This is software used to protect data that is stored on a network. This is achieved through implementing and using a series of predetermined security rules. So these rules are in place and they might look at IP addresses, see where the data is coming from. It might look at a verified username associated with the sending of that data. So it has rules in place. And if those rules aren't followed, that data can't come into the network. Now, but the packets of data, they are accessed both entering and exiting the network. So we're seeing things going both into the network and out of the network and going both directions the packets are checked against the existing rules and this helps determine whether a specific packet or source may be deemed malicious all right so what kinds of data is coming in what's it trying to do what data is it requesting from the network or the specific platform or service that we're sending back out to and based on those patterns and the type of data and the type of packets we then can deem whether or not it is malicious and if it's something we will ultimately block from entering the network if that is done so. The second area we'll look at is that of encryption. Now this process scrambles data using public or private key encryption. Okay, so that if the data is read by an unauthorized user, whether during transmission or storage, it will appear as incoherent symbols. So if we're accessing data on a network and we're communicating with a server, sometimes you'll see that a lock in the actual uh, browser window of your web browser where the domain goes. If there's a lock there, it means data is being encrypted during transmission, which means when it's being sent from your system to the server, it's being scrambled, then sent, and then when received, it's being unscrambled so it can be read on the server's end too. This can also uh, happen for local networks as well with specific hard drives being used on systems. They can also be scrambled too so that the information can't be read by unauthorized users as well. That's why we say transmission and storage. And essentially it's turning it to incoherent signals. So if an unauthorized user does look at the data, it won't make sense, it's just scrambled. Okay, the same encryption key then needs to be used for the decryption process, which is the reverse process of turning the scrambled data back into a readable form so that an authorized user who has the public or private encryption key can then read the message and comprehend it back in its readable form. All right, so that is used both for storage and transmission. The third area we're all very familiar with, and that's just the use of passwords. Okay, a secret word or string of characters that is made up of combinations of letters, symbols, and numbers. Now, the combination is key because we don't want our passwords to be easily guessable. Passwords are entered on a login screen, usually along with a user's username, and they check the username along with password in order to authenticate a user and grant them access to a network. When creating a password, Foundations can be in place for specific platforms that need to be followed by users when they create their password. And this can relate to things such as strength. Okay, so it could be something that the actual password has to contain um, a certain length of characters or not be a realistic word because that'd be too easy to get. Then we also have complexity. And as mentioned, that might mean it must use symbols, numbers, and characters all within the actual password in order for it to be acceptable to be used on a network. We have change frequency. That means the password might have to be changed every three, six months, or a year as well. And the password is changed into something different. But then in saying that, it brings us to our last point of reuse you mightn't be able to cycle through the same two or three passwords over and over again because they get recorded. And in doing so, someone could guess that password because you're using it so often. So we try to limit the amount of passwords people can be cycling through every time they do change their password. Companies need to make sure that they do have these rules in place so that passwords aren't easily guessable because it's Yes, it is to the user's detriment if their password gets guessed and someone 
gets their access to a network, but it's not just to their detriment, it's to everyone within the organization's detriment. Because if they can get in, they can look around then and look at other people's data, depending on the access privileges that people had. And then that brings us to our next point of user access levels, because these are often mapped to user accounts, okay, which passwords are using in conjunction with. So permissions need to be established in order to determine which users and within an organization have the right to view specific information. Now, that's just saying reading data, but we can also determine what they can do with that information, such as edit, which means make changes to information, read only, just look at it and not do anything, comment on it, which means suggest things to happen to that information, or even share that information with others, which could lead to a disclosure, okay, uh, that is out of our control if an unauthorized party gets a user account with that access level that has shared privileges, and they can share it with pretty much anyone they want. So that's why we've got to hence go back to our previous point, have strong passwords in place, so they're hard to guess, so unauthorized users can't use other people who aren't authorized this account in order to gain access into networks. So user access levels are very important. And it's also just to protect data within an organization too. Not everyone within an organization should have the same rights to view all data. Access levels should be mapped to people's job roles and tasks. People only be able to see sensitive data that is relevant to their jobs. The final area we'll look at is of security software. And we'll talk about two types here. The first type being malware and virus detection software, which scans systems for known malicious software based on virus signatures. Virus signatures are lines of code that are known to be malicious. And the reason it looks for the line of code as opposed to virus names is names can be changed very easily on a, a program. Okay, you just go rename, bang, it's got a new name. But the actual lines of code that are known to be dangerous that might duplicate information or delete information or make things execute when you don't want them to or open up a hole in the network that someone could get some spyware into, that's where the danger is in the lines of code. So antivirus software or anti-malware software looks for these virus signatures, sees if they're in any programs that have been uh, uploaded into the network or come through an email attachment or whatever, and then puts that software into quarantine for further analysis where a user will decide what to do with it. And ultimately, if it is dangerous, they'll likely delete it. And then the final software to talk about is that of intrusion detection software, which detects when an unauthorized user or bot is trying to gain access into a network, either trying to or already has gained access into a network. Okay, once in, or, or at least if trying to as well, administrators will be notified and they'll see that the IP is trying to get into the network, okay, and they will determine what to do. And think of a response and it might be block that address from trying to gain access to the network or try to trace where they're coming from or look for further information that might guide their thought process in what to do about this person trying to access the network. So I hope this video is giving you an understanding of these five different classifications of data security tools that can be used in place. They're very common, these ones, okay? They're things that you're probably already familiar with, okay? All being used in different way. Ultimately, a firewall protecting the network itself with its predetermined rules, encryption, protecting data during transmission and storage through scrambling information and making it incoherent to those who don't have the decryption key, passwords, strings of characters that are used along with a person's login to authenticate themselves when they enter into uh, their account to access a network, okay, user access levels, which guide what users can do when they are a part of a network, whether they can view, edit, or share data, and then finally security software, helping protect the actual network itself by assessing programs that are installed on the network to see if they are malicious or looking for people who are trying to get into the network that could be deemed malicious as well and deciding what to do. Okay, obviously we use all of these combinations of these in order to protect networks and protect the data that we have that is stored in our networks from unauthorized access.